Well, greetings, test takers. So this is Dean Tenney coming to my studio in fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, very excited to share with what will be practice test three on the channel. Uh, my channel has collaborations with uh, a paid supplement, Test Geek, Brian Lee, Test Geek Exam Prep LLC, where you get 20% off and you get a free look on the second practice exam that's in the playlist. I did the first one. And uh, Kaplan has agreed to further their collaboration with our viewers here on the channel in our Reddit communities, R Series 7 and R66 and R Series 24. Those are Reddit communities. And uh, to further that collaboration, uh, Kaplan has given me uh, permission to explicate Captain pra uh, Kaplan practice files. So that's what we're going to be doing in the SIE. Uh, you also get, for our viewers and members, you get 10% discount on any Kaplan product and services, and the 10% uh, discount at checkout is Guru10. All right, so let's get started. An investor who buys or sells options on stock is an owner. And, you know, explications aren't only about the right answer. It's about what the wrong answer is. Or to be an owner of the company, you would have to own their stock, either common or preferred. A lender to the company. Now, if you were a lender to the company, you would own their bonds. You're not a stockholder, so you're speculating. You're getting options are not issued uh, by the corporation. The issuer and guarantor of all options is the options clearing corporation. XYZ debentures are trading at uh, 1200 while well, similarly rated bonds are being offered at four and a half. What is the current yield? Now there's not much math on your SIE, but uh, current yield is something you should be able to do. Current yield is what an investment pays you divided by what it costs you. So the first thing you gotta be able to do is figure out what this bond pays in interest. And the way we do that is we take par, par, which is a thousand, and we're going to times that by 6%. And we find out that that's $60 in annual interest. Very testable to know that $60 in annual interest will be paid semi-annually. So that's annual interest. And so we're going to take what it pays us, in this case, the annual interest, and we're going to divide that by what it costs us, the current market price. And when we do that, it's priced at 1200. Uh, let me get out my calculator here. You can't give up uh, you know, practical application questions. You simply just get it right or you get it wrong. 60 divided by 1200. And I come up with a uh, 5% there. Boom. So the four and a half has nothing to do with answering this question. The four and a half has nothing to do with answering the question. Uh, the four and a half would be meaningful. Then, you know, that's kind of a hint why it's trading at a premium, but it has nothing to do with answering this question. Let me clean up the slide here. Uh, by the way, if you get good at the teeter totter seesaw, you should know that it has to be something uh, less than uh, six if it's at a premium. So that would have been helpful too. You could have used the teeter totter seesaw. Uh, which of the following would be unacceptable reasons for an officer of a member firm to make a contribution to a political candidate? Uh, the candidate is a member of the officer's uh, political party. Uh, two is certainly a problem. The candidate has promised to steer business to the officer's firm. Two is certainly a problem. The candidate is a close relative of a potential customer. Uh, the officer proves uh, the policies and programs of the candidate. So I probably would have done this by reverse engineering this. Uh, we know that we need two. We need two. And so we got to decide uh, what's better, given uh, I have a choice of two and four and two and three. And uh, four likes it looks like that's going to be better. So we'll go for two and three on this one. Uh, the thing to know, by the way, on that one is that that's uh, $250 is G37. And you have to be able to vote to give them the 250 bucks. And if you violate the rule, there's a two-year prohibition on negotiated underwritings. Uh, your client, uh, Jane Anderson, has owned QRS for a few years, but has now turned bearish. What transaction would you recommend? So she owns the stock, and it says she's uh, interested in uh, protecting this position. 
So she has owned it for a few years, has now turned bearish. What transaction would you recommend? It sounds like what she needs is some protection. And so, oh, listen, I thought this is Dean reading this wrong. For a few years, it has now turned bearish. What trans I was thinking they're going to ask us for an option, uh, but there were, what they're asking us for is what is the offset? So she did an opening purchase. And so the way you're going to offset that is to do a closing sale. So we're going to tell her to sell QRS to close. And time to go home, turn the security back into the money. Earned income includes which of the following? So you earned income is uh, you working for money, you working for money. And so interest income here is going to be in dividends on the mutual fund, a portfolio income tax at that same rate and a year in bonus. Uh, I'll probably miss this one, uh, but I'm gonna go for uh, child. So which of the, you're gonna go which of the following? Year in bonus is what I'm gonna go for. Uh, that's something I get through my employer. And the other things are something not coming through my employer. So I, maybe I'll miss that, but that's the one I'm going for. Uh, all the following may be callable except. Yeah, preferred stock is not callable. So, you know, a call feature is the issuer's uh, ability to call it away from you. And call risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. And so all the following may be callable except. Yeah, preferred stock. The issuer would like to be able to replace high cost preferred stock with lower cost preferred stock. Preferred stock is a fixed income investment vehicle. So even though it's equity on the balance sheet, it works like a bond. Corporate bonds, certainly. Muni bonds, certainly. Given that answer set, common stock. Uh, I think the takeaway is to make sure preferred stock you understand, even though it's equity, is a fixed income investment vehicle and it is a customer's portfolio, much more like owning a bond because that's a fixed income, you're getting that percentage, whatever it is. But I also know zero coupon bonds aren't uh, callable and treasury notes and treasury bonds are not callable. An investor is long an option contract and wishes to exercise the contract. The investor is notifies the broker dealer then who then notifies, very testable. You definitely need to know this is the Options Clearing Corporation. The Options Clearing Corporation, very testable is the issuer and guarantor of all options. So they're the ones who make sure that's going, uh, everything's going to go according to plan. Then once the OCC gets this, they will select a broker dealer randomly. You know, there's various broker dealers who have customers who are short this particular option contract, and they'll do that randomly. Uh, the firm can do it randomly, uh, five or another fair method. Um, most of the option questions are recognition. So is this first leg of your testing journey, you know, give some thought to how much you're going to spend on the options for three or four questions. If the next leg of your testing journey is the uh, Series 7, then, you know, any work you do on your SIE is going to pay dividends there. But, you know, if you tell me you missed the mark on the SIE because of options, I'm going to say, well, you know, they're mostly recognition. Your client, Dana McCarthy, has no investment experience. So we're going to have to be careful with Dana. She just retired and won't be in a high tax bracket. So that means munis are out. She's also concerned about volatility of her investments, and she's more concerned about preserving her capital than getting a high rate of return. What would you recommend? So uh, here it says she's retired. I don't think I'm going to go for a money market. A money market, newly issued treasury bond. Uh, I think I'm going to go for D here, a uh, long-term U.S. government bond mutual fund. Newly issued treasury bond, she'd have you know interest rate risk on that. And uh, she, you know, if she has a mutual fund portfolio, hopefully responds with different maturities. And uh, certainly not going to do B. That's a local government investment pool. That's not for her. And uh, money market short term debt, yeah, maybe. But I think D is our best answer given that answer set. Suitability questions are always challenging because they come down to judgment questions, and then you typically get a 50-50, and then you got to decide which you know which uh, trigger you're going to squeeze. Uh, list the dates associated with the dividend payment in proper order. Boy, this is really important. And we have a memory aid device for you on this. It is called DERP. A good way to remember the proper chronological sequence. I'm just trying to get a bigger font here. Is DERP. I'm getting a different color because you should definitely know that the X date is not set by the board of directors. 
The X date is one business day prior to record. This is a function of the Uniform Practice Code, which standardizes practices within the uh, secondary market of the securities industry. So it's either FINRA in New York. And so now we're gonna apply our memory aid and we're gonna look for DERP, Declared X Record Payable. I'd also know where is that X date? When is it? One business day prior to record. I'd also know what it is. It's the first date on which the stock no longer trades with a dividend attached. So make sure you've uh, got that down. Now, if I haven't said so, I probably should have said this before we got started, we're on question nine. If you're gonna use this to do your own intellectual inventory, what you should do is stop, you know, pause, attempt the answer yourself, then hit play and see how you did. You know, then you match it up with my explication. When an employee is either terminated from or willfully leaves a member firm, for mu5 so u4 is hello to an associated firm so you can do your sie without sponsorship but the next leg of your testing journey will require a broker dealer to sponsor you and you're going to fill out a u4 and that u4 is going to ask you a lot of things and then if you leave the firm they're going to file a u5 so here u5 are you're disassociating from the broker dealer under these circumstances which of the following is true the employees are responsible for filing the form u5 when leaving the firm willfully under either circumstances, the employee is responsible for filing Form U-5. The employing firm is responsible for U-5, only it has terminated the employee. Uh, under either circumstance, the employing firm. So you, the broker-dealer is required for telling uh, FINRA that you're no longer associated with them. So the answer is D. Uh, a married couple opens a new account with a broker-dealer as tenants in common. Very testable to be able to contrast joint tenants with rights or survivorship with tenants in common. With joint tenants with rights or survivorship, very testable. Both parties own 100% of the account and the decedent share goes to their uh, surviving party. Tenants in common, there is a fractional interest, very testable, and the decedent share goes to the, uh, the state or uh, beneficiary. So let's look at what this says. Uh, male BB said, a married couple was attendance in common. Explaining the details of the account, the registrar would not indicate which of the following. Would not mail may be sent to either party with the permission of the other party. Orders may be given by either party. Certificates may be registered. No, 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 no. You know, whatever the names are on the certificate, that's how it's going to be. Uh, there we go. The student's estate, that's very testable. Make sure you know this, that's very testable. Remember, this was asking us, which is not true. Either party can add the account, there we go. Uh, which of the following settlement arrangement and settlement occurs on the same day? So regular way settlement for corporates and munis is T plus two, I definitely know that. Settlement is when ownership changes hands. I would definitely know for options and gubbies, it's T plus one. And if you'd like this to settle the same day, you would do cash settlement. Now, don't confuse a cash settlement with a cash account. Don't confuse cash settlement with a cash account. Uh, contributions to an IRA can made, be made up to which of the following dates? April 15th of the year following the year the contribution is four. That's pretty good. April 15th, the year of the contribution. It's April 15th. So this is coming up, uh, right? 2022, the contribution making is for 2021. Uh, the bid price, very uh, testable to know the bid and the ask. Uh, I have a entire 15 minute lecture on know your bid from your ask in the playlist. And the bid represents, if, let me just put one up here. Let's say I'm a market maker. I'm gonna publish both my bid and my ask, and uh, you know, uh, you should probably have both of these down. So the bid, let me get a different color here, is the price, let me get a different font size. This is the price that the market maker buys. And this is the price at which the market maker sells. And the way I think of it is whenever customers looking at two prices, the customer always receives the low price and always pays the high price. What's that called? The securities industry.
So here it says uh, the bid price, the price the broker dealer is willing to pay when buying the security. That's correct. The price the customer will pay. No, the customer would pay the asking price, not the bid price. The price the customer will receive. Yeah, one and three is choice C. One and three. That happen. Not a good sign if you're looking for the answer and ain't there. <laughs> you know, so. Intraday price changes due to normal market forces would be found in. I kind of like this one. This is kind of fun. Uh, you should definitely know that hedge funds, there's no such thing as hedge fund shares. You know, hedge funds are organized as partnerships and they don't trade at all. So, you know, maybe I start with process of elimination, so it ain't going to be that. And I should know that open-end funds don't trade supply and demand in the secondary market. And open-end fund, every share is a new share. So I should know it's not that one. I should definitely know that closed-end funds trade in the secondary market. Now, here it says market forces, but that means secondary market supply and demand. And so it looks like my answer is going to be both exchange-traded funds and closed-end funds, one and two. Uh, definitely testable. And then make sure you can contrast uh, ETF how is an exchange traded fund different from a open end fund? Uh, I'll leave it to you to make sure you do that. We have lectures for you on that as well, but you know, uh, the big difference, right? ETFs can be purchased on margin. They aren't based on forward pricing. So just make sure you get that down. All right, so this is one and two. Uh, which of the following is true regarding a member firm operating under the FINRA membership or the membership of another SOR, SRO? Very testimonial that FINRA is the self-regulatory organization for the securities industry. Uh, member firms must always accommodate dealing with retail investors and not limit business to that done with other industry professionals. That is not true. There are entire broker dealers like Citadel Securities. It's a market maker that has no retail customers. B, member firms that can offer all types of investment products, such as stocks, mute bonds, mutual funds, options, and other or limit the profit products they offer to an only few. Yeah, some of us only sell to institutional investors. Member firms are required to be full service brokers? No. Nope. Member firms may never incorporate proprietary. No. So given that answer set, it looks like B is our best answer. Now, I don't suggest using test taking tricks and all, that's all, of it, all, all else fails, but sometimes too long to be wrong. <laughs> it's not a bad uh, guess. The buyer of an option contract, very important, is considered to be uh, all the following except the long party. Yeah, to say you're the buyer, owner, long holder, most important thing is that means is you have a choice. You're not the writer. Writer means you're obliged, you're a potential victim. And boy, that's the most important uh, thing is to know we have two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. So the other version of this question would be, all the following except the uh, seller of an option, it would be writer or seller, right? So make sure you got that down. All the following are true regarding account customer account statements except customers must be alerted uh, to report any accuracies or discrepancies promptly. Sounds reasonable. Customer statements containing penny, penny stocks must be sent monthly if there's no activity. That is very testable. That is very true and very testable. You should definitely know what a penny stock is. It's a non-NASDAQ OTC stock under five. Uh, customer statements must be sent at least quarterly. Yep. Monthly uh, statements need to be sent if there's activity. That is not true. So it's a D. A registered rep is discussing fee-based and commission-based accounts with a customer. All the following are true except. Fee-based accounts are most suitable for those who do very little trading during the course of the year. That is not true. I mean, if you're not doing very much trading, you're better perhaps to just pay for the transactions. So I think A is going to be all the long or true, except I think that's false. Now, sometimes if you're struggling with these except questions, what you might wanna do is, you know, put T or F next to it. And so I'm just gonna remind myself that I think that is false. Uh, a disclosure of what services the fees cover and a fee-based account must be made to the customer before the account is open. That sounds pretty uh, reasonable that we should tell them how this works. I'm going to say that's true. By the way, if you're using this method, you know, even if you don't know something, you can put a question mark to it and at least get it to, a, you know, 50-50, so to speak. A fee-based account charges a single annual fee 
They can be uh, they can be a fixed dollar amount or a percentage of the assets under management. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that we're talking about an investment advisory account or not, but you know, um, so far um, it still looks like a. Hey, maybe I put a question. I'm not quite sure here if they mean is this a you know a fee I'm paying for trades or for investment advice. A commission based account bills for each transaction separately. Uh, that is certainly true. And I'm going to make an assumption that the uh, fee-based account we're talking about is a wrap account, in which case the answer is going to be A. And, you know, even yours truly, I doubt I'll get 100% of this thing because who knows, going quick, I could have missed an accept, but we'll see. We'll see. I got to get rid of that. Uh, which of the following regarding open-end and closed-end investment companies is true? that boy, you really, listen, I don't care what the second leg of your testing journey is, whether it's SIE and then you're going to six or SIE and you're going to seven, you really want to make sure you got mutual funds down because on every exam, they're gonna torment you about the differences between open-end and closed-end funds. So this says, which of the following is true? So one of these things is not true. The price of an open-end company is set by supply and demand. And you should definitely know that's not true. The price of a open-end mutual fund is determined by the calculation of the net asset value, which we have to do every business day. And the NAV plus the sales charge is going to equal the public offering price. Which of the following is true? So, oh, they're asking me true. So you know, almost made a mistake. Just told that. RTFQ. So let's see. Well, let me change my answer. I guess I have to actually do only the closed end may issue additional uh, shares with then changing its charter. A closed end, to, uh, end company sets its own dividend. That's not true. An open end may sell fractional shares. I'm gonna change my answer to D here. I'm not a really big answer, but uh, closed end, we buy like a stock in round lots. That one, one, one I may uh, miss. Which of the following regarding open end and a closed end is true? So A is false. Uh, B is only closed and may issue additional shares without amending its charter. Yeah, you know, we'll see what that what the rationale says on this one. Uh, only the closed end may issue additional shares. Well, once they do their IPO, they don't issue additional shares, but if that's available on the charter, they certainly could. So only the closed end may issue additional shares without changing its charter. Yeah, I don't like that. I'm gonna go for D. Let's see what happens. We'll see what happens. Uh, someone responsible only for training associated person at a FINRA member firm. So all you do is train other people, need not hold any registration, and need not be registered, and need only be registered reps. No, if you're training others, you should be a principal of the firm. You know, you should be, you know, we can't have, you know, baby brokers, you know, training other baby brokers. Uh, which of the following is true of closed end funds, but not open. You see a pattern here, this is really testable. So which of the longest true of closed end, but not open end? Closed end A have a fixed number of shares. Yeah. Um, which of the longest true of closed end, but not open end? Yeah, A, right? That's the whole point. They trade supply demand. Both pay dividends, both can invest in a variety of securities and both can sell common stock. A March 30 call is purchased at three and has been expired, has expired without being exercised. So that means at expiration, the stock was 30 or lower. This expired and I bought it for three points or $300. And so it looks like I'm a loser. And it sounds like a bad thing, but that's a good thing. When you buy an option, one of the good things, you can only lose your premium. And so you need to know, let me get out my annotation tool again, that this was three points on one contract and each contract Governs 100 shares, and so that is going to be $300, and boom. So, yeah. If a call of one is priced at par, which of the following is true? So, again, this is not a lecture about the teeter-totter or the seesaw. But when you buy a bond at par, all of the yields are the same. All of the yields are the same. 
So current yield is less than the yield of maturity. Uh, no, it'll be all the same. The yield of maturity is less than the yield of call. No, it'll all be the same. Current yield is greater. No. A customer is given a quote. Again, we've talked about this. It's very testable. And so you want to get a handle on this. So I'm just going to take the liberty here. Let me get a smaller font. We said 17 is the bid. And 1725 is the ask. And the six by 12 is the size of the quote. So you say, Dean, what's the quote? I say right now it's 17, 17, 25, six by 12. Now that six represents 600 shares, six round lots, a round lot is hundred shares. So I say right now uh, it's uh, 600 at 17 and 1200 shares at 17, 25. So remember we said the customer is gonna be on the other side of this. So let's get a different color. Let's get a different font. And we said the customer is going to sell at this price. And we said the customer is gonna buy at this price. And so it says a customer, the customer can sell uh, 1200 shares. Now, if the customer is selling, it's gonna be at the bid price. So that's not true. So the customer can't sell 1200 shares. And right now, if the customer is selling, it would be at 17. Uh, B, the customer can purchase 1,800 shares. Nope, sorry, there's only 1,200 shares there, Mr. Customer. Uh, C, can sell 600 shares at 17. Yeah, right now there's a market maker who is willing to buy 600 shares into their inventory at 17. So yeah, that is very much a test question, very much a test question that uh, you're gonna see and encounter. Uh, which of the following is not a type of a real estate direct participation program? Which of the following is not a type of real estate direct participation programs? Yeah, partnerships. Yeah, I'm not really liking this answer set because existing properties do provide us income. But I'm going to say that that's what they're looking for here because the others are obviously our direct participation programs, partnerships. So real estate, new construction, raw land. So I'll go for A. Let's see if I get it right. Uh, very testable about where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. And so this is a buy stop order at 39. So the order at 39 could fill at which of the following uh, uh, prices. So it's a buy stop at 39. There's no limit here. This doesn't say buy stop limit. So once the stock trades at or through 39, it becomes a live market order. And if it's a live market order, that means I want immediate execution at the best available price. And so I will accept all of those. In general, the first industry form that a new applicant for registration sees is the U4. The lengthy form requests information about the applicant, uh, including, or applicant name, including aliases, yep, a residence history through the previous two years. And it's not two, it's five. Ten-year employment history, yep. Uh, convictions, but not arrest, dealing with any securities. And so now I have a problem because uh, I want to say I want three. Um, convictions, but not arrest, dealing with any securities-related violations, name including aliases, uh, that one's kind of tough. Resident history back through the previous two years, 10 year employee. Oh, it's five years. It's going to be one. Uh, I just noticed here that it's saying uh, 10 year employment history. It's actually 10 year residency, five year employment. So that's helpful. So I need one and two, one and three. Uh, I'm going to go one and three. I may have missed that one. We'll see. Required minimum distributions for IRAs must begin uh, at 72. And remember, Roths do not require a required minimum distribution. So no RMDs for Roth, but otherwise it's 72. A broker dealer's business continuity plan to be enacted in the event of significant business disruption requires all the following except, all the following except. Uh, alternate physical location of the employees if needed, data backup, yes, 
notification to regulators within one hour of the event, prompt customer access to funds and securities. Yeah, they, they, we don't have to, there's nothing about telling the regulators within an hour that we got to do something. A luxury tax that consumers must pay that is levied on non-essential items of certain value or more is an example of, well, we had this, uh, Congress had passed a, a tax on yachts. Uh, they had a tax on cars at one point that were over like 90 grand. So uh, that's legislative risk. What Congress giveth, Congress can take away. Anything that has any kind of a tax implication is legislative risk. An investor is long MJS stock. For this investor, which of the following is true? Uh, the risk is the stock falls in price. Yep. Uh, the risk is the stock remains stable in price. Maximum loss could be unlimited. That's not true, right? If you buy a stock, it just goes to zero. The risk is the stock price goes up. No, it looks like it's A here, right? You're wrong and the stock goes down instead of up. Uh, shareholders meeting of ABC Corp will take place in eight days. A customer whose stock is being held in the street name has not returned the proxy statements. Uh, which of the following is true? The member firm votes the shares as recommended by the issuer's management. The member firm must ascertain how the investor wishes to vote the shares. The member firm may not vote the shares under any circumstances. Uh, the member firm may vote the shares if, as it wishes on minor manners. So it's not D, it's uh, not uh, C, uh, may not vote it. No, we are gonna just vote with management. Uh, class A mutual funds are where we pay the road, load up front and the maximum is eight and a half percent. All the following are considered current assets. Uh, cash are things we plan to turn to cash within the next 12 months, and a warehouse is not that. A warehouse is a long-term asset. Uh, which of the following is an example of an unsecured debt security? So remember, debt security, debt security. So not preferred stock, not a mortgage bond, it's gonna be one in four. Income bonds only pay interest when and if earned, and they're used in bankruptcies and restructurings. A customer under several orders in complex securities without concern for returns and losses. The suspicious activity is most likely the result of which stage of money laundering. So money laundering has three stages. It doesn't sound like it's placement because we're already making trades here, right? So, you know, what it looks like we're probably trying to do is uh, layering, which is mix our clean money with uh, dirty money. So, uh, and again, it's commercially, looks like it's commercially logical. I'm gonna say that's lay layering because it doesn't look like placement because we already have the account open up. We'll see, I think I'm gonna get that one right. And then the last stage is integration where you can't tell my dirty money from my clean money. Uh, you are gonna get tested on the 10 grand, the five grand, uh, 10 grand for the CTR, five grand for the SAR, uh, FinCEN where you send these reports to and uh, money laundering. So be prepared for that, it's gonna be there. Uh, I'd also know the thing that gives the bank, the financial institution, the ability to release your, your records is called the Bank Secrecy Act. Definitely know that as well. If a broker dealer suspects that a transaction involves funds derived from illegal activity, the SAR would be triggered at what threshold? At least 5,000, it's actually 5,000, and it's gonna be uh, more than 5,000, at least 5,000. It's uh, gonna be more than 5,000. I don't remember which one is the five. It's 10 is the 10,000 or more. I think it's going to be at least five. We'll see if I get that right. So later here. Inflation risk is closely associated with definitely purchasing power, right? And you definitely should know that bonds don't typically do well in an inflationary environment, whereas common stocks do. Very testable. A registered person has left the securities industry and now holds a manufacturing job. Under what circumstances may this formally registered rep continue to receive commissions on the work done on the person's at the person's old firm? Um, yeah, we need to have a, a, you can get paid on commissions you originally put on the book. It's usually for retired reps. So I don't know if they're trying to cloud our minds with you're out of the securities industry and you're now working at a factory, but the rule is about continuing comm commission uh, a contract must be signed by the registered person and the firm. It's not the firm, it's between the registered reps. Any contract must include the provision of the person's spouse must receive them, not must, that could be part of it, 
the person may only receive commissions from current trades done by those. Yeah, that's the thing. You only can be paid continuing commissions on customers that were once yours before you left the firm. All the are true regarding breakpoints for mutual funds, except a breakpoint sale is considered to be a sale. Uh, breakpoints uh, considered, to, yep, that's true. Greater the amount, the lower the sales charge, that's true. Breakpoints should be, must be disclosed, yep. The first break is mandated by the industry. Now, I don't know of any rule like that. I'm gonna say that's not true. Uh, someone who purchases shares of a corporation's common stock has neither liability nor voting rights. No, no liability, no voting rights, limited liability. Yeah, your stock can only go to zero, right? That's a good thing. So, you know, nobody calls you and says your stock's at negative five and you get to vote, either through statutory or cumulative voting. Uh, municipal securities rulemaking does not regulate, does not regulate. Yeah, they don't have any authority, any regulatory authority over municipalities. What they do is they publish rules. They publish A rules, administrative rules, D rules, definitional rules, and G rules, general rules. And those apply to people in the municipal securities industry, securities industry, not municipalities. So the writing of rules and regs, that's all they do. They have no enforcement power. Trading, yep. Underwriting, yep. It's uh, D. An inver investor purchased 100 shares of stock at 20. So that's called my cost basis. Cost basis is when I turn the money into the investment. So that's my cost base. Uh, four years later, I sell it at 28. So that's pretty cool. So I've held it. I've been at risk for more than 12 months, held it for more than 12 months. And now I turn it back into money and I have $800 that I've made. So I have an $800 long-term capital gain. The investor would report this transaction on a per share basis as a 28 capital gain. Nope, uh, B, $20 was our cost basis and a per share basis, uh, eight bucks, eight bucks. Uh, one of your clients wants to set aside some money for her nephew who just turned uh, 30, but she has some reservations. She does not wish her, his numerous creditors to have access to money until after she dies, but she wants uh, him to have easy access to money at that time. You recommend, well, that's the whole point of a transfer and death, or one of the major points is that, again, it uh, goes uh, to the nephew here without going through that lengthy process uh, that usually would be associated with somebody dying. So, A, uh, very much a test question, very much a test question. I hope when you're doing these explications. This will be uh, practice test three in the SIE playlist. You have some three by five cards or four by six cards or notepad on ones like this. That I just tell you are going to be there. Aim and shoot point and click. Make sure you, you know, get a flashcard for it. Uh, change the tax rates on dividend would be an example again of uh, legislative risk. For example, right now, a dividend of one corporation paid to another corporation is 70% tax excludable. 50% uh, tax excludable. We used to be 70, now it's 50. So that was legislative risk, right? That it went from 70 to what it is today, which is 50. Uh, let's just talk about these other ones. Pur purchasing power risk. We talked about inflation. We said, make sure you know the bonds are not good for that. Common stocks are. Uh, make sure you know that a tip would keep pace with uh, whatever CPI is doing. Currency risk, make sure you know that that goes with an American depository receipt. And liquidity risk means uh, make sure you know that goes with a partnership. You can't get in or out of a partnership without the permission of the GP. An investor has asked, uh, asked a mutual fund company for a copy of its statement of additional information. How, many, uh, how long does the fund have to comply uh, with the request? I'm pretty sure it's three. Let's see, that's another one Dean may miss. Should a registered rep enter a private securities transaction that would entail any compensation the employing firm? So this is called selling away, very much a test question if you don't get permission. So require compensation 50-50, no. Uh, provide all execution, no. Have the opportunity or to approve or disapprove, there we go. And I would definitely know that if you don't do this correctly, it's called selling away. They'll say on the exam, an associated person sells an investment not sponsored by the employing broker dealer without permission. This is a prohibited practice and is known as selling away. All of them are lagging indicators, except 
uh, labor, outstanding commercial loans, uh, personal income, the corporate profits for sure, um, labor cost per unit, outstanding commercial loans. And I think that's uh, going to be lagging. I'm going to say personal income. I might miss that one. But what, what you need to know on the test is leading economic indicators, which are stock prices. If a registered rep is sharing in profits or losses with a customer, all the following statements apply except. If the customer is an immediate family member, the representative sharing in gains or losses need not be proportional. The representative's expertise must be considered may must be considered part of the contributions account. No, that's not true. It's accept, thank goodness. So I get that one. The representative must receive prior written note permission for principal. Yeah, you know, proportionate capital, principal approval. Yeah, the rep may share in gains or loss, but only that's true. So I like this one. Uh, I would probably um, think about what, what I'm held accountable to know, which is proportionate capital and principal approval. And investors looking to speculate in penny stocks would be exempt from the liability or suitability, excuse me, suitability statement under which are the following uh, circumstances. Uh, it says here, uh, established customer is the right answer, right? Established customers, you've done three trades or you had funds with us for a year. Uh, several months of slow economic growth and rising unemployment have characterized the economy. Market ask would describe this as a period of, uh, let's see, slow economic growth, rising unemployment. Stagflation would be high inflation and uh, low unemployment. It's not inflation, not deflation. I'm going to go with stagnation. Let's see if I get that one right. A corporate issuer of common stock has decided that it wants an agreement that its underwriter must either raise all the capital or cancel the underwriting. The best to accommodate that, that's called all or none, right? We're gonna either sell all these securities, we'll create up an escrow account. And if we don't sell all the securities, we'll give them back. We'll give back the money. Which of the following is true regarding short sales? Selling short involves selling shares not owned. Yeah, that's what selling short is, selling something you don't own. In most uh, businesses, that's called fraud, but not ours. Uh, selling shares not yet owned is prohibited. No, we, that's that's not true. Selling short means selling less share. No, and per, no, it's selling short is selling borrowed securities. The business cycle includes all the following. There isn't no waves. There's no such thing as a wave. <laughs> I would know that two calendar quarters of declining GDP is a recession and six calendar quarters of depression. I have an economics lecture that is spot on in terms of the test. So I'll refer you to that uh, economics lecture. Which of the following is true regarding a registered person who wishes to move for registration from one broker or dealer to another? If the registered person takes the 24, no, that's not true. Everybody has to file a U5 and then amended U4. Only form U5, no. In no circumstances, no. A person who has not been registered for more than his grandfather, no filing. Wow, which of the following is true? Regarding a registered person who wishes to move her registration from one broker or dealer to another. If the registered person has taken her past, no fines need. Nope. Only form U5 need be filed. Now there's going to be a U4, 5 and amended U4. In no circumstances can uh, a registration be transferred. Now it's got to be this one just by process of elimination. Each year, a bond pays similarly annualist of uh, nominal. So that'd be two times that would be 40, and 40 on par would be 4%. Uh, in order to receive a declared dividend, well, they're being tricky here, right? The X date, remember, is the first date on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. And so that's when I have to buy it. But they're actually saying, when do I have to be an owner? And I have to be on the owner when they look up the shareholder list and see who the owners are. And when they're going to do that is the record date. So boy, the grammar in this question was kind of uh, atrocious, but it's the record date. All the following government sponsored entities, which of the following is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. There's no better credit quality than that of the United States government. And you definitely need to know that's Jenny May. Jenny May has the full faith and credit. The others have an implied backing. We assume that if they got into trouble, that you know that we'd give them some assistance. Uh, which of the long securities are non-exempt from registration 
under the Securities Act of 33, which of the following are non exemptions You definitely know that C and D are, and then B says corporate debts are, which of the following are not exempt, uh, U.S. government are, so it's A. You should definitely know that corporates and munis are. Uh, I would just warn you that on your SIE, that's not a big deal. But when you come back for your 63, 65, 66, it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. Uh, which of the following is a unique risk by investors and in mutual funds that specialize in holding securities in the fund portfolio from foreign issuers? Well, if it's foreign issuers, remember currency risk, right? You have a bunch of uh, Russian securities in there and get paid in rubles. So, no, that's the best answer given that answer set. I was looking for sovereign risk, but it's not offered to me. Uh, country's annual economic input in the nation, that is very testable. That should be an aim and shoot point and click question for you. That's gross domestic product. The uh, balance of trade or balance of payments would be the balance of trade. So it's B. Uh, during a discussion with a customer about a potential investment opportunity involving securities, standing alone, all the following would be likely be permissible except, hmm, odd language, uh, an investment opportunity standing alone involving securities. The register rep pessimistically implies that investment has a good chance of losing money as well as gaining because the product may not have a market. A registered rep points out correctly, the maximum potential loss is probably smaller than the maximum possible gain. The registered uh, rep points out only that a tech firm, but uh, only that a tech firm has a brilliant product idea and the CEOs have advanced degrees in science. So all the following be likely be permissible expect. The registered rep points out that out only that a tech firm has a brilliant product idea. The register up shows the customer sure with a chart showing best and worst case scenarios for the product development. I'm not even sure what the grammar of this question is, uh, but I just, um, I'm gonna use the Sesame Street trick and I'm gonna go for this one just because it looks different and we'll see what happens. If a prospectus is being used to close a mutual fund sale, it must be given to the investor uh, well, it depends on what kind it is, statutory or, you know, a summary. Uh, I'm going to say uh, before or during. And let's see if it's summary. I might miss that one too. Each of the following is considered a control person under 144, except uh, those persons who own 5% or more, eh, it's got to be 10. Another company that owns uh, 10%, that's true. Corporate office of directors, yeah. So remember, it was except, and so it's A. Those others are. And then remember, they're subject to volume limitations under 144. Which of the following statements regarding systematic risk as it relates to an investment portfolio is true? So there is a tendency of securities, per, uh, securities prices to move together. Uh, diversification ensures that portfolios are not subject. That's not true. Diversification will not eliminate it. Yeah. Diversification can be used to eliminate completely. No. Diversification cannot mitigate it to any extent. Um, well, we can have negative correlation. I'm going to see uh, risk prevails despite diversification. And the reason I'm not tonight in A is because I could actually put in some negative correlation investments that might offset that. So we'll see what, how we do on that one. I'm going to say C. Uh, by the way, I would know non-systematic risk is selection risk, and you definitely can get rid of it by diversification. The following records must be maintained by a broker dealer, the partnership records, articles of corporation, board of directors, form BD, and the amendments to the form, how long they must be. Okay, the key thing here is form BD. That's how you become a brokerage firm. That's a lifetime record of a brokerage firm. So is the articles of incorporation. So spam is the way I think of a st stock ownership, partnership agreement, articles of incorporation, minutes of boards, meetings. So lifetime records. Which of the following would be a secondary transaction? Uh, an additional public offering is a primary offering. Broker dealer arranges a customer order to be executed. There we go. Open and mutual funds are primary transactions because the mutual fund is receiving the proceeds. And IPO are primary transactions. You're at least going to get one question about 
primary versus secondary transactions on your SIE. If large money centered commercial banks begin to lower their prime rates, which of the following is most likely to occur? So this is like JP Morgan, you know, uh, Citibank, uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. So which of the following is most likely to occur? Smaller banks will need to increase their lending rates for credit worthy customers. Smaller banks will need to offset the lower prime rate by increasing the broker call. Broker call has nothing to do with this. Broker call is about margin accounts. Smaller banks will follow by lowering the discount rate. The discount rate is by the Fed. So that's not it. So I know it's not B, it's not C. Smaller banks will lower lending rates for credit worthy. Yeah, they're gonna follow uh, suit. They're gonna follow the big boys. Which type of investments are more susceptible to interest rate risk? Definitely should know that's bonds, you know, fixed income investment vehicles. Which class of shares use a contingent deferred sales charge as the main sales charge? That would be a class B share. Broker dealers are uh, and registered reps may be subject to each of the following administrative and regulatory bodies, except yeah, uh, FINRA, yeah, state security, yeah. CIPIC is a, you know, isn't a regulatory body. CIPIC is what pays you if the broker dealer you're doing business with goes under, we can't find your stuff. And I would definitely know SIPIC coverage is for 500,000, of which more than no more than 250,000 can be cash. The investment company of 1940 classifies all the following as investment companies, except, you know, you know, private investment companies are like hedge funds, venture capital funds, those kind of things. Those others are included in the definition of the Investment Company Act. A shared loans preferred shares that allow the possibility of receiving more. So, you know, we agree to pay you more if times are good. That's called participating preferred. Participating preferred. Under the de minimis exemption for an IPO of common stock may be sold to an account where restricted persons have a beneficial interest as long as that interest doesn't exceed. I think that's more of a 724 question than a SIE question, but uh, oh well. Okay, let's see how we did. Okay, so we missed. Let's go back and see which ones we missed. Uh, your client, Dana McCarthy, has no investment experience. I don't like this one. I'm going to, Chuck is the guy, Kaplan, who writes it. She just retired. She's concerned about the volatility. She's more concerned about preserving her principal. Yeah, I, I can't see myself. And yeah, I, I, I'm going to stick with my miss on that one. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, let's see, what's my, what's our next one? Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Uh, let's see, the next miss was, uh, by the way, look at the beauty of the QBank here. Uh, if you are not a Kaplan person and, uh, you know, you're trying to decide as an SIE, what QBank, Kaplan is known for being the best QBank in the securities industry for these things. So if you're using uh, some other vendor and you want to a supplement with this QBank, uh, please do so. If you're a Kaplan customer, you shouldn't need any, you know, anything else than what you already have to pass the exam. Oh, let's see, a shareholders meeting. Okay, so it missed, missed it. The member for, oh, I did, wow, Dean learned something new on minor matters. Again, oh, that's pretty esoteric. I'm not sure about that one. I'm not sure what the definition of minor is. I don't feel bad about that miss either. Okay, let's see what my next one was. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, what was my next miss was... Class A are also known as... Oh, that's me not reading. I should have liked front end. I just took up front because I went too quick on that one. That one, I agree, is a miss. That's Dean, RTFQ, read the full question, RTFA, read the full answer set. So that's on me. That's on me. Uh, let's see. Looks like my next one. Uh, what I say, the person may only receive from current trades on Hunter must be signed and the firm. Yeah, I don't know. Restricted person. Some of these rationales are important. Um, 
it's between the reps. So I'm, again, I don't like my miss on that one. If Chuck is the guy at Kaplan who writes these. I call him up and I petition. Say, hey, I don't like my miss on that one. Okay, what's my next one? Uh, in no circumstance, a register be, oh, okay. So I, again, I didn't read this correctly. Uh, I was thinking about the person and uh, I legitimately missed this again from RTFQ, RTFA, the registration can't be transferred from one firm to another. The individual does that. So um, transferring from a member firm to the person resigning, must you for, yeah, I, I, I got that right, but read it wrong on the grammar. Okay, that looks like, uh, yeah, well, that's not too bad. And even your, yours truly, right? So uh, I hope you found that uh, worthwhile. If you did, let me know, because as I said, uh, we have uh, expanded the collaboration we have uh, with Kaplan. The collaboration is any member of our communities. Our communities are our three Reddit communities, our Series 7, our Series 66, the R Series 7 is for uh, people who are taking their SIE or their Series 7. I moderate there is Series 7 Guru. We have our Series 66 uh, community. That's for uh, people who are studying for their 63, their 65, or their 66. And again, I'm moderating there. And then we have our R Series 24. These are all our Reddit communities. And that's for people, test takers, who are studying for their 9, 10, or 24. And then we have our YouTube channel, as you are watching this from my YouTube channel, and our YouTube channel community, uh, same thing. So all our members of those communities, viewers or members, are entitled to the collaboration with uh, Kaplan, which means you get to watch explications of Kaplan, Kaplan QBank simulation exams, and you get a 10% discount on all Kaplan products and services. So anyways, thanks for your uh, time. And if you have any questions, just put them in the comment. I respond pretty quickly. And uh, we'll be putting this on the channel in our next slot for premieres. We premiere on Tuesdays. So this will go in the slot for a Tuesday premiere. Thank you very much. And uh, wishing you good testing vibes. SIE, get a victory there. And then go on to your six or seven and get another testing victory.